Captain's Report, February 4th, 2009. Five years. Five long years. That's how long it took us to develop this game. At first it was going well, then scrapping after scrapping. Delays after delays. Made was going to be a quick development game. Into five years of hell. Of course that's all game development is today, it's hell down there. But now we finished it. Halo Wars was a surprise to the community. It wasn't the same developer making first person shooters, it's a company that is called Ensemble Studios who were acquired by Microsoft, making Halo Wars. The developers are well known by the game called Age of Empires, a hall of fame of achievements from real-time strategy games. And in the 6th and 7th generation of consoles, there were games that produces a lot of real-time strategy games. As simple says, You should play some Starcraft, I don't know, maybe World of Warcraft. Maybe some strategies, you know the Lord of the Rings, the Battle of Middle Ears, there's strategy as well. There's a lot of good strategy. And I agree, Simple. There is a lot of great RTS games that were produced, and Halo Wars is the best example, but that doesn't mean the development has setbacks. One of the things we want to do with Halo Wars was tell the Halo story, show the Halo universe in a different way. Halo Wars 1 had a trouble development, but before we talk about its development, we have to go to the previous histories of Bungie, dating all back to Myth. Myth was made by Bungie from 1997. It is their classic RTS game that in retrospect, people seem to enjoy. And a big fun fact, Halo CE pre-production was supposed to be a third-person shooter that transitioned to the RTS and transitioned to what we know now. The game was presented for the iMac until Apple gave the Halo IP and Bungie to Microsoft, where they innovated the FPS genre by using a controller where it was impossible at the time. Therefore, you would think Bungie would support Ensemble Studios on making the Halo project, which is the opposite. They didn't support the game, they were against it. But why do Ensemble Studios were forced to make Halo Wars 1? It wasn't really planned or made. But when they were developing a game called Project Phoenix, they showed it to Microsoft, and Microsoft was happily ecstatic about the project. But QSD said, why not turn your Age of Empires game with a code of Halo Universe? Because as Microsoft view it, it has more sales and market value for the Halo IP. Which wasn't easy. Every model, every sound, and newer designs that fits to the Halo game needs to be made. It was the example where they crunched hard to get the games made. It was shown in 2007 for the E3, and only two years later, it was finally launched at the same time where they shut it down. It's because they were on the staff. Jeldrike mentioned they were the only 25 people who work on Halo Wars, while the rest work on the other projects like Titan and the cancelled Halo MMORPG, which was rough, where they sleep on the desk and ship the demo that is low quality and the employees weren't satisfied with viewing the demo. Another factor is the prototype, where they spent 12 to 18 months for the console for Age of Mythology, and Microsoft forced Ensemble to rebrand into the Halo game and build everything from the ground up. It was a surprising when you view Microsoft's idea. I discussed this before in my ODST video. Microsoft the Halo brand being mainstream and saw the opportunity to capitalize it like making a variety of media of genre in gaming, shows, and etc. Every genre, TV, and movies failed, except for Halo Wars. But it came out of a cause where they traded one company for another.
This part is more about the history of the project, and I recommend watching save data for the giant detail of the Halo Wars, link in the description. One thing I felt bad for Ensemble Studios is where they originally wanted to create an RTS console game and making a new universe, story, and setting, especially for Divine. He had a great reputation on being in different companies and projects. It wasn't valuable for him to just code AI that is walking. He quickly got promoted to designer and writer. As soon as Microsoft dropped the bomb at Divine, where if you want to continue this Project Phoenix, you need to make the Halo game. He wanted to quit, but he didn't. Instead persisted and searched about this Halo. Every lore, comic, and games. Ironically, when he said making the story was easy, it became the most challenging for him in his career. He had to study the game, what was it all about, that he didn't know, because he was new to the franchise itself. Secondly, making an RTS console was another challenging part where they had to endure. Usually if it's a FPS, they copy the control scheme of aiming, shooting, and movement. If it's an action adventure game, they use different varieties of attack and events. RTS controllers don't work like that. They had very few games about the control scheme and had to build their own by looking for existing products and testing the controller methods. Every week, if not every day, they took what worked and refined what didn't work. Ensemble didn't want their identity to be an RTS company. A big example of this is that Diablo inspiration was cancelled, and instead of working on Halo Wars, they worked on the Halo MMORPG which was also cancelled, having no choice on going Halo Wars. They looked at the game and had so many ideas that were clashed by the similar teams. This led Divine, being the writer, instead of having two roles, writer and designer. While well, Dave took the designer, where they had experience on making different Age of Empire games, but he scrapped every design of it. What you see in the demo was smoke and mirrors pre-recording bullshit. But after all the setbacks, delays, and reworks, they finally have done it. And the game was released on February 4th, 2009, where they closed all doors and left a message goodbye. We put the lady down and talk about this man to freak. As you wish. Halo Wars is the first RTS game I ever played, and I actually gone suicide to play on Heroic. Due to my inexperience on the genre though, this timeline is all about analyzing all of the mission designs, and some parts were the reason why I love Halo's large scale battles. The first mission takes you to Alpha Base, teaching you fundamentals of the game, how you move, use, and command. It is the first part where the soundtrack kicks ass. Anyways, the plan is to gather your troops and retake the Alpha base. While well, moving to the second mission, I just want to mention how good the soundtrack is. You should see in my videos I mentioned this later, but in this instance, you could already tell how each soundtrack has its own style and also respects the source material itself. Stephen Rippey at the time composed his different soundtracks of Age of Empires, so he's already experienced in the industry, but transitioning to a soundtrack that needs to feel like Halo is a hard task. But as soon as you open the game, he already exceeds expectations. Halo Wars is one of those soundtracks where it's my top 3 best Halo composition, and that's saying a lot. While Bungie and 343 industry soundtracks evolve over the years and improves upon it, Halo Wars is the first game where a company has different types of melody that satisfies. Second mission is Relic Approaches, another tutorial but also allows you to explore your own leisure whenever you want, teaching its gameplay and how the game works. There's also optional objectives that reward your exploration, 
like destroying a base and their supplies, rescuing warthogs, and having reinforcements from a pelican. Even if the tutorial can be slow and tedious, the game gives you freedom if the tutorial ends, wanting you to explore all the fogs of war and get rewarded by your effort. There's also another part that I like about this game, called Skulls. Earning Skulls is simple, killing the requirement of an enemy and showing the location for your prize. It's easy, simple, and can be challenging to different situations. Third mission is more of a narrative of getting ambushed, so you're able to control the Grizzlies while Forge is holding down with his marines. The game reminds you how it feels to be in a tank, just like the previous Halo titles, killing all of the infantry and hunters. It's fun how many locations and set pieces there are, which is something that I haven't talked about yet. The game being the first Halo Covenant War gives the writers and designers more freedom on which planet, location, and setting there is. I applaud this because rarely the game has any repeats in terms of locations. The fourth mission is Arcadia City, a mission that spikes hard like a truck. And this is where I criticize the balancing. Game design in general is a progression. The more you progress, the harder it gets. Halo Wars Arcadia City is a mission where I have massive problems at first. The game is a coin flip because of your Spartans that you cannot control, and never having repair troops to repair the plane except power-ups. It is the mission that intentionally makes you pitch perfect, so that any mistakes will be punished. You're not guarding the plane? Too bad. Banshee is here. Moving to guard the planes? Uh oh. The base has been destroyed. It's frustrating because you do not know when the Banshee will arrive, and even when they come, sometimes the AI randomizes on which one to attack. Luckily, I restarted the game and had a smooth journey because my Spartans are useful and you always have to micromanage your troops by splitting them up and relying on your own power-ups often. Until a few seconds later, my plane got destroyed by a mega turret. While sad, I was happy I defended both of the planes because without it, I could have restarted the mission. Moving out to Arcadia City, a small island and this is the mission which I have a love and hate relationship to game design. The enemies have their max level, making it difficult for the player to manage. This leads to jacking vehicles being the main goal, and holding out enemies until Spartan reinforcements arrive. It even lets you get out of your comfort zone to attack the mega turret. But one thing that makes this mission hard is there's so many enemies that are max level, while your troops don't have that condition due to lack of resources, which is something I hated. Sitting there building troops and having my heroes down, it's frustrating until the whole Spartan army joins, and it becomes really easy to end it. Overall, with this mission, it is hard to defend until the reinforcements arrive, but having to control an army of Spartans is something I wish I could do more often. Maybe a mod? Anyways, mission 6 is Dome of Light. This is where the adaptability comes into use. Using infantry is a pain in this mission because the dropships always summon. I miserably failed at first and had to restart. Although Halo Wars game design is a rock paper scissor type design, therefore my plan is to go to these reactors, upgrade the supply pad, and then start building vehicles. The Wolverines and the Scorpions are the meta for this mission. These plasma rhinos are a fun level design. It's a progression where destroying the Covenant shield. This is also about defending the plasma rhinos, and after destroying the shield, it's time to blast all of these supplies. This mission is where you need to start adapting, what troops to build, since optional objectives are banshee, it forces you to use wolverines to counter the banshees, and I appreciate that punishing your current playstyle and forcing you to expand your wide array of troops, the same applies with the scarab. This version of scarab is one of the best level design in Halo Wars, charging it forward with your whole army isn't a great idea, you have to bring your troops to split up. And since the enemies aren't max level, upgrading scorpions does a lot of work of destroying generators, where the scarab beam slows down. It's also interesting when fighting the scarab. It's another progression where its target beam gets slower, so bringing warhogs does the trick due to mobility, and finally having a satisfying explosion. Playing this mission again changes my perspective. People hated this level design, but I believe it's because sending all of your forces only to get decimated by Scarab isn't fun. So with the tips I gave you by splitting your troops, it's really satisfying to destroy the prototype Scarab. Right after the Arbiter capture Anders, we must go to the signal that is... Oh no. The Flood. One of the spookiest mission. Sort of. 
Despite the bias by playing all of the Halo games, this doesn't scare me anymore because they are predictable. But if you're not into Halo, this mission is really great for scaring the player and always curious on what is happening, which is cool. The Flood can transform your Marines to Floods. It has unique Flood forms and similar forms for the Halo games. I feel like the Flood is one of those factions that doesn't have that depth, which is a shame because the Flood could be a potential third faction that attacks everyone and making it miserable. But nevertheless, the Flood still does the role, but not as threatening and heroic. I believe in Legendary it would have been a different story. After that troubling mess, the situation is the Flood. What I love about the Flood is you cannot permanently destroy them. They respawn, fill with numbers, and so on. In fact, this mission is my favorite in story perspective. But gameplay-wise, doesn't have that mission design where you're impressed. It's more about that linear gameplay on what you expect, and it kinda sucks for this mission. I wish we had more mission designs where we retreat and defend due to its threat being massive. With the setting and gameplay, it works. I'm not saying this mission is bad, it's just that Ensemble Studios doesn't utilize the threat of the Flood in the gameplay section. It's just one of those missed opportunities I just wish its gameplay design would have existed, but the mission is serviceable, at least, and the next mission approves its game design. The next mission is Shield World and this mission is something unique. Your allies are trapped and needing to be evacuated. There's a timer on the clock, and you can increase more time by using the gremlins. And the more squads you rescue, the better your troop survivability. One thing I give credit about Halo Wars is not by location, but game design. Each mission brings something to the table, even in Arcadia City and outskirts. As much as I hated its balancing and artificial difficulty, I have to give credit where the credit is due. Mission designs are distinct, and it is one of the highlights for this video, that over time, when I'm writing for this video, I started to appreciate it. Moving on to cleansing and repairs. Since this is a two-parter mission, because it's the same location, for some reason, in a split mission, probably because of the pre-render cutscene. These two missions are a multi-faction fight. It contains the Flood, Sentinel, and UNSC, but the second mission is just the Covenant only. And while fun, it's just a simple design, clean the Flood and repair the core. There's moments like the cleansing where it damages all of your units except sentinels and turrets helping you shoot the dropships. Overall, when you have all of the resources and units that you can spawn, there's not really much to say about these missions aside from the scripted sequence. But while it's cool in the cutscenes perspective, in the gameplay, it's more of a letdown. After fighting the ships and fixing the core, and they somehow escape and is saved by Forge. Beachhead is my favorite and simple mission. It's starting small into conquering the entire place. It's actually one of those missions that is a cakewalk until the end which is the Scarab. But for some reason the Scarab struggle on shooting the ODSTs, a bug that I will gladly take. And finally, the end. From a gameplay perspective, the mission is fun. You have to be aware of the Banshee destroying turrets, preparing marines to take down the base, and so on. In the story perspective, it doesn't matter that much sadly, which I'll talk about the specific mission later in the timeline. Planning to destroy the Forerunner fleet, the reactor is now in Operation Ground and needs an elephant transporting. It is an escort mission done right, because when the elephant destroys on the ramp, you have to restart the process, giving consequences using elephant as a combat instead of a support. I think over time as the mission progressed, they ran out of ideas on what level design should be, and having no choice, you can see it in mission 11 to 14, has been basic by the books. But basic doesn't mean bad, it's just a bit disappointing when other missions like Scarab or Dome of Light does it better, but the last one, totally redeem itself. The Escold Escape Remember when I said I love multi-faction fights? that fights each other often, escape is probably the best mission because you have three sides of the faction. It is the last mission that has a timer, and a challenge mission too. It has all of the elements on what you learn through the campaign, managing your troops, objectives, multi-factions, conquering bases, and more. Probably the best Halo RTS mission I have ever played, because the game gives you freedom to do everything, every power-ups, factions, and heroes. It's just a shame the last one I got bronze coin when almost all of my missions contain gold or silver consistently. In conclusion, Halo Wars campaign is one of the campaigns that is engaging and never tires you out with repetitiveness. Each mission has its own style, setting, and objective. 
that isn't repeated throughout the game, except cleansing and repair. But as the mission progressed, you can see how the mission dipped down in ideas of level design. But the last mission escape is worth it. Because after you learn all of the mechanics, the game gives you those mechanics in an entire package, and as a non-RTS player, it's fun seeing factions fighting each other, while the spectator through the fight. And it's very simple playing the game, as a rock paper scissor gameplay. It works on the Halo Wars, but the story on the other hand is something interesting and similar to previous Halo titles. Halo War story is really hard to analyze because I'm already a hardcore Halo fan and I played all of the campaigns except Halo 5. I watched Hidden Xperia about the Halo lore and almost all of the campaigns I enjoyed in storytelling like Halo 4. Even if I'm very harsh at it in my first video, it was my first time writing an essay about it and playing the game again, it changed my opinions for the better. So before going to the plot, there's always a unique thing about this game which is the action scenes. It's more frequent and fun to watch because of Blur Studios, that is their first Halo game to make a cutscenes and following up to Halo 2 Anniversary and Halo Wars 2. So you gotta give them props about their involvement and improvement. Anyways, it's also their perspective of seeing so many tanks, raids, marines, grunts, hornets fighting each other like it's a private alien stick wars we dreamt of as a kid. That's one thing that is unique about this game and its sequel, but going through the characters, plot, villains, and fan services is what I previously said is hard. So what I plan is two categories, characters and the plot, with a bit of fan service or references. If this is the only game you played, the casts are quite likable, but with compared to other Halo games, it makes these characters worse rather than being a fan favorite. Its roles are also similar such as the Captain, Sergeant, Arbiter, the Prophet of Regret, same voice actor by the way in Halo 2 and Team Fortress 2, which is kinda cool, and the Spartans except we have 3 or more. The only difference is Anders, a scientist that is like an AI. What makes these characters forgettable is how similar they are that is called playing too safe, but it's a shadow to different characters we love. Let me give an example about Arbiter in Halo Wars and Halo 2. Arbiter in Halo Wars is being a one-dimensional asshole that doesn't care about his soldiers and throw away lines from his past through the comics. When your character doesn't give a lot of depth and you only show that through lore, you kinda fail the villain right there chief. Halo 2 Arbiter is shown through the mistakes he committed, how smart he is against the prophets, and so on. We see his character shifted through helping the prophets to become against it. I'm not saying Halo Wars Arbiter should be like that, but we get a little glimpse about his character, and when Regret mentions it, A most noble cause for one with such a troubled past. It's irrelevant to the story, such as Regret. He isn't the main villain, but we don't see much of him except commanding the Arbiter for instructions and being evacuated to the ship just for fan service sake. However, there's no denying that Halo Wars Arbiter is a badass dual wielding maniac which is quite ironic when his badass is his downfall and thrown away by the Spartan being forgettable. What about the heroes? Do they suffer the same fate as the Arbiter? Not really for the most part. Forge is a badass marine where he's useful in situations and making a heroic sacrifice even if he's outshined by Johnson. The Spartans are such a fun addition, seeing them wrecking elites and being useful soldiers in the battlefield that can change the tide like the chief. The only time I actually think that our heroes suffered from this similarity is Captain Cutter and Serena. Although Serena is more of a side character and is more into strategic talk as an AI, it makes sense, so you could make some excuses. But Cutter, oof, oh man. I just think he's a flat character until Halo Wars 2 came out. Halo Wars 1 Cutter is more on strategic talk like Serena and doesn't act heroic or anything, in fact it's the opposite. Expecting trouble, Captain? Harvest may be ours again, but I don't think the Covenant appreciate that yet. And a thousand heroes who swore to fight their way through hell before they'd ever, ever turn their backs and run. And where you see one old ship, 
I see home. And that is always worth fighting for. The former doesn't have that same punch, where the latter has that punch of hope and inspiration. What he suffers the most is how he talks like there's no problem every time. Unlike Halo Wars 2, he's more confident through his expressions. This isn't comparing him to Captain Keys, even if Keys is better in every way, like rallying marines, driving a covenant ship, and personally risking himself like in Reach to seek out what Noble Six carried. In general, if you think about Halo Wars characters, it's similar to the previous stereotypes, but plays too safe on how they can be characterized, which is also why people like the characters. And that's true, they are likable characters that we love, but comparing them is another angle where you could say there are some issues with it. Back to the plot. The story is taking Harvest from 5 years and then continuing the war, that suddenly, this part is confusing. When Anders touches this circle, this shows something which convinces her to go to Arcadia City. And we still don't know why, because we're just told to, instead of showing us about this circle. But the problem about the writers is they didn't clarify us and leaving Harvest to Dust and Echoes to set on Arcadia City. Now the plot is more into gameplay of saving civilians, destroying supplies, and the prototype until Regret told the Arbiter to capture Anders because it requires a human touch to activate the Forerunner fleet, which he completely succeeded on his mission, where Forge and the Spartans went back to the Spirit of Fire to chase the signal that is completely off guard by the Flood, which is why they evacuated, rescued the Unicees, and survived the Flood. After everyone is boarded, we get to be in the ship. Arbiter sends his forces to stop the Spirit of Fire, and we never see Regret again until in Halo 2. The plan didn't work for the Coven, and Arbiter just uses Anders for the Forerunner fleet, and somehow, Anders escape even if there's multiple honor guards. Guess they're quite blind as a stormtrooper. And after that, she knows how to defeat the Forerunner fleet, and this is the final rant for this video. Instantly knowing how, without clues, assists, and details. This is also a problem from Halo Wars 2, where Anders instantly knows the solution without assist from Isabel that creates a plot hole. This applies to Halo Wars 1. If your character instantly knows the problem, it gets boring and loses tension from this plot that I was invest in. Therefore, the ending isn't as satisfying as I would hope for. Aside from the action scenes and escaping from the giant blast, its ending isn't worth it in my opinion because Anders' mind is smarter than Serena, even if she's an AI that calculates. Speaking of the ending, the crew is in the middle of nowhere, and Captain Kate decides to make the crew on par of sleep. Let me tell you this, out of all the complaints, plot holes, and characters issue I have with this game, I love the journey through these characters, because it makes the Halo universe much larger in scale, that brings new story opportunities like in Halo Wars 2. Story is mediocre though, never thinks outside of the box, but thinks what works and repeating the retreading makes the character worse. If you remove the comparison of different Halo games, Halo Wars 1 storage stands well, but it isn't memorable like the Halo games I played. Skirmish is a multiplayer RTS mode, although it's for AI. There's 4 modes, 6 different heroes, and maps that are actually a lot, with gimmicks such as the Mega Cannon, Teleporters, and Temporary Bridges for examples. Variety is the mode's biggest strength. Because of the difference with the UNSC and Covenant, maps are based on their own theme, heroes have different special units or abilities, and 4 modes that you can play. My favorite mode is Deathmatch because of its large scale war. You can make a 3v3 map to a 1v1 map, and the game still accepts it. While I would love to cover this in depth, I only play against the AI, but nevertheless, I would still cover and talk about the skirmish positives in a straightforward manner. I mentioned before the difference between the UNSC and the Covenant, because Covenant leaders have abilities that can be destructful. They're much more in numbers, and the scarab in this game is, well...
Having to play the Covenant, there's a lot of difference when playing in the faction. And what's even more shocking is they only do this for one mode, the multiplayer. In the context of the hard development is something I want to praise. UNSC is similar to the campaign and I've discussed it already in the gameplay section, so we don't need to cover that side. Moving on to the general gameplay, you start a base with a scouting vehicle, getting supplies, making yourself stronger. There's two types of attacks you can do, early aggro, which is the short term, or slowly building bases that can be helpful in the long term. I also like that you fight the insurrection in Halo, something to this day I would love. Each map has its small gimmicks, and you could use them to your advantage, and finally finishing our adversary. There's something special about Halo Wars multiplayer RTS, and it's quite sad there's not a lot of people playing. Imagine playing with players and there's a lot of scenarios that they can cover. Sadly, I never was in the multiplayer space that time because I didn't have an Xbox Live. And most people don't mention about Halo Wars multiplayer. It's because of the population's decline, probably due to the hardware limitation. But still, a shame. Halo Wars is an odd game. What spawns us in new IP for Ensemble is a Halo Wars that's branched out of that existing IP. It's weird to see me talking about this game because it wasn't really planned or mentioned. I never get to see the developers' experience of that unusual idea, except their documents, videos, and more. I felt like making this game isn't worth it when you sacrifice a company, and that's a take I will stand. Halo Wars is my first RTS and I heavily enjoyed its game. But to those who aren't Halo fans, and seeing them crumble, it's a shame. Because Age of Empires is a popular game, from what I heard. I hope that developers watching Halo Wars can see their effort isn't something in vain. Because while the campaign isn't the brightest, it can stand its own two feet. And Skirmish isn't as memorable. However, there's little details, maps, gimmicks, and faction's uniqueness makes me want to mention about Skirmish. I originally didn't plan to cover Skirmish, but since I played Skirmish multiple times when making this video, it's the reason why I deleted the video and made a small segment about it in the first place. I'm back making review videos and, and I'm quite happy to make them. While they're longer to make, I would say this though. I love watching esports Counter-Strike while editing my video. I just wanna say if I'm not motivated doing these, I'll try to mix up things a little so I won't get bored. I love doing different batches because at the end of the day, it's something that makes me keep going, even if I have less engagement overall. So yeah, see ya, and bye bye guys. Thank you for watching though, and alright, this is the last time, fuck, see ya.